So here we are thinking about birds, and we've just been singing about God being like a bird, calling us to shelter under his wings. So God used a bird. The idea for this whole series came when I came across two stories. And uh, I'll tell you those as we go along. The first story was about a bird, of course. And the second story resulted from someone who heard the first story about the bird. So we'll come to those shortly. But I thought it would be useful just to remind ourselves of some of the birds mentioned in the Bible, the ones that are on the screen. I'm sure you'll recognize uh, what birds they are, especially if you're uh, interested in birds. But the first thing to remember, of course, is that God made the birds. Genesis Genesis chapter 1. This is day 5 of creation. God said, let birds fly across the earth. So God created every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, let the birds increase on the earth. So God made the birds. And we remember Cecil Francis Alexander's famous hymn about praise to God the creator, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors. He made their tiny wings. And isn't it sad that we're, we're growing up, children and grandchildren are growing up in a generation where many of them are not hearing the basic Bible truths that there is a creator, the maker of heaven and earth who created all things, the living God. So God made the birds, but he didn't just create the birds, he wants us to consider them. Matthew chapter 6, the words of the Lord Jesus, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will wear, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You'll notice it says, that's verse 26, look at the birds. Some of your translations will say, Consider the birds, but the word actually means think seriously about them. Consider them thoroughly. Learn well from them. We're not just to look at the birds and that's it. They have a lot to teach us. The story is told about St. Francis of Assisi. He was having a sleepless night and he heard the sound of a nightingale. And just at that moment, God spoke to him. God used a bird to speak to St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis was persuaded that the song of the bird was an act of worship. And for the whole night long, St. Francis chanted, whatever his chants were in those days, he chanted to the praises of God alternatively with the nightingale. God used a bird So for the sake of time, I've just chosen, as you can see, five well-known birds. We all know about the sparrow. Luke chapter 12. Do not be afraid. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? We would say nowadays, well, it's not worth tuppence. It's useless, next to nothing. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. 
God cares about us. God cares for us. And he doesn't want us to be afraid. God who made the earth. I don't know if you know that song as well. God who made the earth, the air, the sky, the sea. Who gave the light its birth. Careth for me. God cares for us. I'm sure we've all heard of Richard Birnbrand and the time he spent in prison. And there was a time when he was so weak that he couldn't leave his bed. And he would toss and turn through the night in delirium and hardly slept. But there was a tiny window up in the, the, near the ceiling of his cell and he could see the sky. And one morning he was woken up by a stra- what he called a strange sound. And it was bird song. And he hadn't, because he'd been in prison so long, he hadn't heard birds singing for ages. And it reminded him of a, a story he heard about Martin Luther. And he told this story to his fellow prisoners. He said, Martin Luther would go walking in the woods And he used to raise his hat to the birds and say, good morning, theologians. Theologians, teachers, the birds were teaching him. Good morning, theologians. You wake and sing, but I, old fool, worry over everything instead of simply trusting my heavenly father, just as you do. So the birds taught him. God used a bird to teach Martin Luther the great theologian of the Reformation. And then there's the eagle teaching us about life, life in the spirit. We were singing about it. Uh, I will soar with you like wings of an eagle. Draw me close, draw me to your side. God wants to teach us to soar with him, to to get away from ourselves and our self-consciousness and our earthly things and Be in his presence and learn to to soar with him. Isaiah 40. You know well the, the verse. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And Psalm 103 in verse 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Whatever we're going through, if we spend time in God's presence, praising him, focusing on him instead of ourselves, God renews our strength, our spiritual strength. The eagle. And then we come to the dove, the beautiful, harmless dove, emblem of peace. Mark chapter 1 and verse 10. We all know the story of Jesus going to the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, the gentle Gentle dove. Spirit of God, we sing, unseated of the wind, gentle as is the dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus is sending out his disciples. And he's saying you're going to find a lot of opposition. So he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So be on your guard. Now, the next bird, you might find it difficult to find this in your Bible because from what I could see, it only occurs in the King James. <laughs> For some reason, it's called a, a, a desert owl elsewhere. I wasn't able to find out just why. But uh, this is the pelican. And you know, of course, pelicans like water, don't they? And they like fish. And Psalm 102, the psalmist says, I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. 
Now you can imagine what, what a pelican would be like in the wilderness with, with lack of water. Uh, in, at the beginning of Psalm 102, the psalmist is he's afflicted, he's in distress, he's taunted by his enemies, he's way out of his comfort zone, and he's crying out to God, and he's saying, I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. When, when we had our Israel trip a few years ago, we were traveling along in the bus, and I'm always looking out the windows. Uh, I love to see the scenery, and it was field after field after field of all the crops you could think of. And then we came to this particular area, and it wasn't fields, it was water. And I'd asked the, the, the guide, what, what was this all about? He said, those are fish farms. And, I said, and there were nets covering over, and, and I said, what are the nets for? He says, that's to protect them from the pelicans. Because apparently every year, thousands of pelicans migrate from Europe over Israel into, into North Africa to, to escape the win winter cold. And they're a terrible nuisance to the farmers. But here we have this idea of a pelican in the wilderness and isolated and out of its comfort zone and stressed. Some of you might have heard of Howard Goodall, uh, from England, he's a music composer, and he put a number of psalms together and he entitled the album Pelican in the Wilderness, taking the words from Psalm 102. But finally, our, our last common bird is the raven. And I'm sure you can think more of stories about the raven. And the idea here is deliverance. Psalm 147. This is speaking of God. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. God feeds the ravens. But then it says in Job chapter 38, this is a question this time. Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Question mark. You remember the latter chapters in Job? He's putting question after question after question to Job. He's putting him in his place. He's, he's gently taunting him. Job, you think you know everything. You're a great debater. You don't know a thing. Who provides food for the ravens, Job? You don't. That's the idea. But here God provides food for the ravens. And Luke chapter 12, again, it's the Lord Jesus speaking this time. He says, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap or have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. God feeds the ravens. But if we go into the Old Testament, you probably have the most familiar reference from 1 Kings 17 about Elijah. You know the verse as well. God's leading Elijah out of danger. And he says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward. Hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. And I have ordered. It says in the NIV I was using, I have instructed. Other versions will say, I have ordered. I have commanded the ravens, to supply you with food. We're not, we're not talking about somebody who's got birds and he's trained them. This, these are wild ravens and God's going to order them and command them to feed his servant. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Is that not amazing? Two meals a day from the birds. God using a bird. Of course, Elijah could have died of starvation. Just imagine, what, what food would you get to eat in a ravine in, jo in Jordan today where there's next to nothing? 
like stone, sand and stone. It's a, it's a miracle of deliverance, which, which we put on the screen there. And that leads me into our stories I want to share with you tonight. They're both true stories. They're not in the Bible. They're contemporary stories. But they're stories of undoubted deliverance from the most unlikely of sources. And I'm sure you'll agree they glorify God. And I trust they will fill us with awe tonight as we hear them. I better tell you the source of the stories. Uh, they came from Ron, Ron Boyd McMillan. Some of you associated with Open Doors may know the name. He's the Associate Director of Research in Open Doors, and he's traveled extensively across Asia where he heard this story. And he's largely responsible for the Open Doors World Watch List that comes out every year. He was born in Scotland, but raised in Belfast. His, his father, Ron McMillan, was a pastor in Templemore Hall, East Belfast. And if my memory serves me rightly, he preached in this church at least once. But he's the, the brother-in-law of the late Drew Bryce. Now, some of you will remember Drew, who was here. He was a member of this church. He taught maths in Kilmarnock Academy. Now, sadly, he's passed away. But uh, Ron Boyd McMillan is the husband of Morag, who was married to Drew. So that's a connection. She's a, the older sister of Ron. Uh, the background to the story was uh, Tibet. A beautiful country, as you can see. Look at that spectacular scenery with the Himalayas in the distance. I don't know if you know your geography, but you've got China, Ch Tibet, and then the Himalayas, and then India underneath. And Tibet, you've got the mountains, and then very much desert, open plateau. Uh, apparently, uh, Tibet would like independence, but China, China has granted them to be a, an autonomous region, uh, providing they behave themselves, apparently. You'll see the yak, which is the main beast of burden, with all its many uses, obviously meat, and you'll see the, the, the hairy coat uh, for, made for jumpers, all kind of clothing, and also its skin, yak skin, which can be used for like bags, and I've even seen a picture of, of them using yak skin to make small boats to cross the, the rivers. The dominant religion is Buddhism, with all its multi-gods. And one of the things that they do is to practice a sky bird. Oh, we, we, better, we better go back and see the, the bird of the story, which is a vulture. I was thinking when I was preparing this, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. I don't know if you'd call that a beautiful looking bird, but that, that's a vulture. Okay, um, now, the, the, the Buddhists practice a sky burial. And the white material there that you can see is yak skin. And what they do is they offer up dismembered parts of dead bodies to the gods. And especially to the vulture, because the vulture is a sacred bird in Tibet. And you'll see the Buddhist the Buddhist monk sitting there. Uh, it reminded me of Matthew 24. Wherever there is a carcass, the Lord Jesus said, he was talking about his second coming, it will be obvious. And he said, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Look at the crowd of them there, just waiting for their breakfast. I, I, I assure you, I could have off, uh, shown you much more horrific images than that, but I spare you the sight of them. These dead bodies were offered up to, because the vulture is sacred, if, if your 
dismembered bodies are offered up to the vulture, you are being honored by offering your remains more or less to the gods. So that's, that's the background. So here's the story that Ron, Ron McMillan was told when he was in, I think he was in China at the time. There was, there was an evangelist in Tibet going to evangelize the Buddhists. Some of the local, some of the local uh, Tibetan Buddhists heard about him and were angry and annoyed and they caught him. And believe it or not, they gave him a sky burial with one big difference. He was still alive. Sky burials are for dead, dead bodies. So he was put inside this yak skin and he was left to the vultures. And then apparently the, the Tibetans, there are so many evil spirits that they're afraid of. So rather than watch this, they disappeared. Even, even as far as he, he told the story, they weren't, even, they weren't even anywhere in the distance. He was left. So he was, he was in there expecting a, long, a short or long, rather, excruciating death because it was so hot in the summertime. Uh, hot sun, baking sun. But then he told this story to a, a Chinese evangelist. It was the second day and he began to hear noise about him movement, pecking, and he, he realized it was vultures were outside. He would, he would have been inside one of these. And they began pecking at the yak skin. And he said he was so far gone that he hoped that they would come and peck his eyes out and get through into his brain so it wouldn't last long. I don't know if you know about... Uh, there's times when I've been hill walking and you'll see the carcass of a sheep. And not necessarily the carcass, but a dead sheep. But what you notice is the eyes are out of it. Because the, the ravens or crows in this country like, obviously like the taste of eyes. So he was hoping that they would peck through, peck through his eyes and get into his brain and have a quick death. But as time went on, he began to realize they were pecking through the yak skin and opening it up. So eventually, despite his weakness, he was able to get out. And how, how he, he got back into civilization, we're not told, but, but he, was, he was delivered. He said he was eventually able to emerge like a butterfly from a cocoon. An amazing story. When I first read that story, I was flabbergasted that that could happen. That was a, a miracle. And God used a bird. But then there's a follow-up story. There was a man in Hong Kong, China, Hong Kong, lots of stories get about, missionaries moving about. He heard this story. He was a securities dealer. And he'd got himself into debt, bad debt with gambling. And he couldn't pay back his debts. And in one week, his wife left him. She took their only child, disappeared. And on the same day, his Mercedes was stolen from outside his house. So he'd had enough. He went upstairs to his flat, put his head in the oven, and turned on the gas. Well, he began to twist the knobs. And suddenly, you, we'll call this divine intervention, divine deliverance. He suddenly remembered the story that he'd been told about this man escaping the sky burial. And he shouted out, God, why don't you save me too? And he kept fiddling the, no the knobs. He said he fiddled for about 20 minutes. I find that hard to believe. But he kept fiddling for 20 minutes and nothing happened. The gas had been turned off that very day because he hadn't been paying his gas bills. And he suddenly realized, God, this is you delivering me. Just like that man in the mountains of Tibet. And he started a new life. He confessed his addiction. He got his wife. 
and child back, began to pay off his bills and believed in the creator God who delivered him out of this impossible situation. Now, they're not Bible stories. They're not stories from 2,000, 5,000 years ago. Contemporary stories. Miracles God performing just today, just as in Bible times. And we just were just amazed at how wonderful he is. God used, he used a bird, he used a story of a bird. And what an amazing thing it is. Let's pray. Before we pray, uh, or as we pray, today's prayer for open doors, we're talking about God cares for us and provides for us. Okay for you and me to say that living in a wealthy country. Plenty of food about at the moment anyway. But in Afghanistan, uh, Afghan Christian refugees living over the border, nearly all of them women, wanting to escape the Taliban for reasons you probably understand as, as well as me. Some of them are doing jobs such as pushing trolleys in order to survive. Some of their husbands and fathers remain in Afghanistan, but the families can't communicate with each other because of the political situation. But it says this, they're holding on to Jesus. And the prayer request is, pray for provision of needs that families will be reunited. We're talking about God cares for us and provides for our needs. And we shrug our shoulders and go and buy our shopping. These people, these people are in desperate situations. So we'll pray for them as well as we'll just worship our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we acknowledge you tonight. We acknowledge your mighty power to deliver. We thank you for these contemporary stories of your intervention and your almighty deliverance. And Lord, we just stand in awe of you and the things that you can do. And we pray, Lord, you will continue to work mightily throughout this world of yours. Some of our brothers and sisters are in dire straits. We think of these women bordering Afghanistan with very little. They don't know how their husbands and families are getting on and they desperately need help. Father, we pray for your deliverance by whatever means you would use. We pray you would help these people, help them to get food, help them to be safe at night, help them to have shelter and that you will show yourself to be their God. So we thank you, Lord, that there's so many ways in which you can work, so many things that you can use, and we pray that we will be those who trust you and believe in you to deliver us, whatever our circumstances are at the present time. So we commend ourselves to you tonight, Lord, and bless you and seek your continued hand upon our lives and we pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.